hello. Just uh, enjoying a, a nice afternoon in Taipei. Thinking about megalithic arch ancient architecture, wondering what's going on with that. So what I'll do is I'll shut that music off because I don't want to be distracted in my thoughts. Okay, well, there I am in 20 years in Taiwan. Check me out on YouTube. Uh, actually, you can YouTube my name. And there I am, and that's my phone number. Give me a call uh, at your own risk. Um, <clears throat> I am in Taiwan, and I'm also uh, doing a lot of teaching of English right now in the university system. I do have some 30 years professional experience, but I've been teaching a lot in the last 20 years. And I just uh, got that picture off of my... Uh, Niece's mom, she uh, took that in L.A., and apparently that was an X-Rocket. I thought that was pretty cool. Also, recent news is uh, oldest tools now found outside Africa proven in China, 2.1 million years old tools, which asked the question, what happened to those people that were using those tools 2 million years ago? And perhaps there was an extinction event that put them out of commission. We have several. We have to look at these, especially what happened two million years ago. They were using tools. Anything two million? No. Okay, well, there is. But uh, here's the five mass. I went over this last time. Uh, you can stop it and read those if you want. Two million years ago, we have a neogene extinction, a supernova. What did that mean? What was That was a cause, but was the, uh, the date was two million years ago. And then... Uh, Less than that, we've got a couple. So this is like the big one right here, Neogene, regarding those tools. Who knows, right? Um, anyways, back to uh, the presentation. Uh, I really didn't really want to focus on it too much, but I, the question, what happened to those people, is a question. You know, you have to ask yourself, what happened? I think I'm lost. Okay, I'm going down, going down. I guess I put in a couple of uh, pages there. Um, one of the things about the pyramids was this. I talked about it last week. I won't talk about it again too much, but I did get some new slides for future presentations. So I'll show you those slides. For example, the, the names of the stars. And of course, the belt is kind of something I never even knew before. Al Nitak, Al Nilam, and Mintaka. I always knew Beetlejuice, of course, from the movie and from the uh, easy to see star right bellatrix it's kind of a cool mix and then rigel i knew that i didn't even remember Saif, Saif, and then the uh, nebula they're not even going to bother naming stars it's just the nebula itself uh, the correlation theory of course says that uh, the three stars of the belt are correlated with the three pyramids in egypt that looks like it's a little off but then again, I'm thinking that could have been enlarged a little more and then it might work out. It, oh, no, wait, 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 wait. So wait. Okay, so those have the pyramids in there, but the photograph below doesn't match. The photograph could be matched up if it wanted. I don't get it. Okay, I may, I shouldn't have used that. Here's some other photographs. And uh, what they're trying to say here is that uh, the pyramids are the – Navel of the world, the center of the Earth's land masses. Here's some also other information. The pi, the base of the Great Pyramid, is a square. And uh, they're talking about pi, and they're talking about the height and the perimeter, and that there were some solid formulas in there that prove that uh, they knew something 5,000 years ago that it wasn't discovered yet. Personally, I just start to glaze over when I look at numbers like that. Uh, that's me, though. There's also some talk about the layout of these three pyramids matching the Orion stars. Interesting. But um, we're going to get into the so-called Russian grid, uh, or if the, if the Earth were a gigantic crystal, where would the ancient sites be on that chart of that energy grid? Now, the re that's going to come up a little bit later, but what I want to point out now is that there is a line with – uh, different megalithic sites on it that goes in a circle 
around the world. They're all connected. But what you don't see is that this circle actually shifts into a possible um, equator, previous equator. Now, what is the equal azimuthal projection? Well, what that is is the type of map we're looking at. And don't mistake it with the type of map that flat earthers look at. I think flat earthers usually look at a map where Antarctica is uh, spread around the edges. And what they're saying is, is that um, the, both poles are on this map. So the, it, has, it shows the curves of the Earth. This is not a flat earther map. Thank you very much. But you can see that the, um, the equator that you see from my projection, I just moved that red line. You can see it's going right through each country, just like we have right now. So what does that say? It says that our previous equator could have been uh, where these, uh, these megalithic structures are lined up. Okay, moving on. Let's not forget that, though. Um, we can talk about a few things. We've got a solar sundial here. Um, I don't regard what that says on the, the right. Uh, he says he thinks there's a knob through to block the floor of the quarry. I don't really um, believe that. I think that it's a sundial. And the reason why is because of what this Dr. Flores says. Now, first of all, what we need to see here is that across the world, we have certain traits that we see in megalithic structure construction, like these clamps. We've seen these around the world. Okay, these little, uh, these little clamps. Here's a picture of a holding two stones together. That's a, a cartoon. Okay, what are we looking at here? Okay, I got things mixed up, so what I'll do is I'll rearrange it later. Uh, the pyramids themselves are aligned. Okay, this is talking about tools that were used in this construction, and another tool is the fact that they had a way of knowing which way was north, although um, magnetic compasses hadn't been invented yet. The pyramids, Giza, and also Nazca were aligned within 360, I'm sorry, 360 tenths of a degree towards the north. And also the Pyramid of Han, same story. So we've got uh, alignment that the Meridian Building of Greenwich Observatory London couldn't even do. When that building was built, it deviated 9 sixteenths of a degree from true north. Some of the oldest tools outside Africa were just found. And that is rewriting the history because we did not think that humans had made it out of Africa before 200,000 years ago. We meaning uh, the, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the, the mainstream scientific uh, um, conclusion is that 200. Now we've got to deal with this new information that Africa is uh, not as old as China. Here it is. Whoops, sorry, went too far. China, two point ago, we had stone using humans. I I forgot to look up the word hominin, so I'm gonna have to look that up again. I, I keep forgetting. Okay, so uh, these little knobs that we find on the stones around uh, the world uh, in these megalithic structures, um, there's there's several theories about these knobs. Um, I think they have multiple uses because Dr. Flores says that uh, he's been doing this research and look at the shadow coming off this one here. And look at the shadow coming off that. Don't tell me that that's used for, look at the shadow here. You can see a shadow here that you can make marks right there to mark your days and what days has storms. You can use chalk. You know, you can put, you can put a perfect outline around that. And this one too. So one, two, three different sh places where you can keep a record. Yeah, it's a sundial. And that's my opinion. Um, this Dr. Flores also matches up. Like here's another little sundial. He matches up these little shadows that are used. I mean, who knows? But do you really think that those little nubs were used to pick up the stone? I don't. I never did. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I never did. I never did. All right. Well, anyways, let's move on. I'm just getting distracted by something. The Dr. Flores actually says he kept a record of the different shadows and the different dates. And uh, he's been keeping this notebook. He, he works there in Lima, Peru. 
And I guess there's certain alignments. There's alignments that he says are significant between the nubs on different stones. It might be a reach. I'd like to take a look at more of his data, but I think it's it's more reasonable than these little nubs were used in the construction phase. Maybe both is possible. But when it comes to megalithic structures and being able to put stones together like this, now that's like a puzzle, right? That's like a puzzle. I guess it would have slid in there and then that on top. Okay, maybe later. But we're talking about how do you, uh, what kind of tools were used? And most of the scientists agree that you couldn't have done this with, this is Egypt. You couldn't have done this with the tools that they supposedly had at the time. So we're talking about ancient civilizations that may no longer exist. I mean, this is the pyramid. This is the ancient pyramid of the big one. This is somebody claiming that uh, this panicular, panic, pinnacle, panicular structure um, was really an ancient original entrance before the pyramid was built. An interesting concept. And of course, those rocks are tight. Now, here's some other evidence of ancient technology for machining stones. This, this shapes have been found all over the world. It's like some kind of a building thing, and it fits in there, and it's, it's strong against earthquakes. I don't know. I don't know, because uh, I'd like to see more. I mean, they're all over the world, these shapes. Megalithic structures along the northern um, area where the equator once was, maybe. You know, these large megalithic structures that are seen in different continents all around. What tools do they use? Here's where there must have been some type of a circular saw or some type of a, the guy said, diamond thread or maybe laser sound or water. Let's think about sound a little bit more. Look at this quarrying method. What kind of scooping technology is this where you have a melted, it looks melted. It looks like that was a scooping, cutting, melting device. It, it scoops and then they broke it off at the top. They scoop up underneath and break it off. Who knows? Who the hell knows? Uh, Brian Forrester taught me a lot about the pyramids a long time ago when I saw this, and he showed some evidence of ancient machining. <clears throat> Look how smooth that rock is. And that's hard granite. And uh, he shows several examples in the video of uh, blade marks, cut marks, you know, here's an here, here's a, a whole piece that broke off, and then it just that's the end of that. And here's the uh, ancient pyramids where they come together. You couldn't even get a hair in there. They, they're that tight. Here's another example of how tight those cracks are. And here's a picture of a uh, right from the side of the um, big pyramid, some uh, weathering and some erosion. It's very similar to the vertical weathering that's on the Giza. Uh, right here, I think I've got a picture of it right there. Well, there's the actual, there's the actual uh, weathering that that's on the um, on the Sphinx itself, and there's one more picture. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, Doctor Forrester says with those type of shafts, uh, they didn't build the pyramids for burying people. They, they, he thinks that it was a machine that ran a giant water network. He says that part of it's still running under the Giza plateau. He says that the conventional explanation doesn't make sense, and there are massive pumps pumping water out of the Giza Plateau. Okay, so how was the movement of megalithic structures done? Uh, ropes, pulleys, hammers, and chisels? Well, vibration and resonance might be another answer, and uh, these giant machines were, could have been resonating energy devices activated by light and sound, and their position in the... Um, I'm not good at this in the map of the world. I'll show you that map later. This is, um, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Where's his name at? It's somewhere around here. I think I showed his name already. Where, where, where? I lost the name. Telling her. Okay, going down. It's telling her I should have a name. These are from his presentation. Talking about how uh, our churches have these cones on them. 
And when people create sound and energy inside the church, it's supposed to send those cones uh, through these cones into the towards the gods. An obelisk, he claims, rings like a bell if you ding it. I'm not sure how you would ding it. I guess with a two by four. Um, he says there's something called sacred Taurus stones uh, that are similar to a Taurus galaxy and spiraling bubbles will appear if you put them in water. They're also uh, used as tools. Um, there were more than 100,000 sacred stones found and they were used for Caesar technology, according to Tellinger. Um, a sonic boom in the world of lasers, June 17, 2009. A new type of laser for generating ultra high frequency sound waves instead of a light has taken a major step towards becoming a unique and highly useful 21st century technology. Sazer technology. Okay, and this is the cone of the Sazer device. Uh, this is a saying that a to toroid vortex field generator emits up to 3,400 decibels in sound. Not sure how it works. I got to see it in use. I have to look this up. But uh, in addition to the Sazer device and how it's similar to the cones in the human eye, oh, Tellinger has a video on levitation technology where he claims that the ice cream cone phenomenon is used uh, not just in the temples of Sumer, but also uh, he believed, I've heard him claim it, that Ed Leedska used this technology in the Coral Castle. Here's ice cream cone phenomenon. Now, Edward Leedska was uh, died in 1951. He's born in the late 1800s, and he was a self-taught, okay, he was an immigrant. His parents um, apparently had some connection to stonework, and he was a self-taught engineer and sculptor who single-handedly built Coral Castle in Florida, which is now a National Register of Historical Places. Um, developing theories of magnetism. I haven't done a lot of research in his developments, but he did this. Uh, Coral Castle was this um, property he purchased, and I assume that it must be part of this world ley line structure. Um, he actually put a, I, I, this is still exists, but I guess there's no more guests touching it. Uh, this stone gate just turns perfectly balanced. He did this by himself. Now, I, I think that I might be able to, I don't know how he cut the stone. He mined the stones by himself and he said he used sacred temple grids like this and like this, um, these ley lines or what they're called the chakra points of the earth on the planetary grid. He has, look at that, it's right there in Florida. So he must have lined it right up and used that to harness some energy. Now there's a lot of things that I'd like to do a little bit more searching on this picture here. Um, I actually had some uh, searches that I didn't, but don't worry about that. Let's just continue. Okay, so this is when he died. This number was his favorite number. Something about this number that he etched into stone. He said, this is his, all his secrets right here. And this picture doesn't show it going through Florida, but these are the chakras. So there may be some differences in those. Okay, Michael Tellinger uh, says that the sound and resonance magnetics uh, helped move stuff, um, kind of, um, oh, this is just some random stuff I copied. I forgot to remove that. Let's move it on. But Tellinger says stone structures are memory banks, such as uh, silicon is the chip memory storing uh, medium. Stone structures are also the same. They store memory and energy. He says that the kings in the first kings of all the land were the temple owners. They would bank energy, he claimed. Not really sure. There he is there giving a talk where I got a lot of these slides from. He says that the people in the auditorium would make the noise and it would send that energy up into the circuit temple, the 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 <clears throat> as all these designs show, the main uh, energy. Um, main uh, chip, like the main chip, the, the processor 
that would process the energy and send it wherever they were trying to send it, usually to the heavens, I think in these religious ideas. But some people say that these temples, including Tellinger, he says these temples were pre-existent and the people who are adding religion to the temples are not, they're ignorant of the previous history of them. These temples were built to harness energy and these columns were too close together. They look like grids. They look like um, the people are creating sound and energy and that these, uh, these grids would take the giant energy and, the, and process them like energy circuits uh, giant energy circuits and integrated circuits. These giant energy circuits would harness energy and redirect it into energy grids using the elements of nature, stone, water, conductance, As macro processors, there's like water in the middle of here, right? There wasn't uh, in 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 um, Anchor Watt. They used to have water in the middle of the stone work. Is that tight? Macro processors like the pyramid itself, probably a macro processor. I mean, we're talking about empty rooms and tombs. Take a look at the next slides. Are they temples and churches, or are they not giant energy circuits? I mean, too many pillars, not enough space, right? Why would they have all these pillars all next to each other like this? Too many pillars, not enough space. And rooms with no doors, are they temples, or are they templates? Telling your ass in his presentation. Telling your says, are they temples, or are they templates? Rooms with no doors. That's it. So Orion, back to Orion. This is old information. The correlation of those, they show an alignment between the stars. That one's a lot better than that other one I had. The whole plateau of Giza, according to this, had an Orion layout, new Orion theory. I say maybe. I always wondered about this, and I finally did it. I aligned the stars, Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, Seif with these three and you notice that the true center is there there is a true alignment of three stars going this way there is a true alignment of that but here it doesn't align connectedly here uh those the belt doesn't either but it's an interesting thing look at that one more time because i used to think about the belt too is that a straight line no however which ones do they use these two are the big ones. If you do it there, then you get that over there on their little plateau Giza. This one is on top of it. Same thing happens actually. But if you go through the, if you go through the the last one, I forgot their names. I should put their names right here so I don't forget. You still have a triangle, and so there is some realistic. But why is it upside down? If they knew what north was, why is it upside down? When, that's my big question. Why is it upside down? I think that's an important question. Why is what, what's going on here? Uh oh, am I getting true? I'm not getting truth. Let me see one more time. Okay, uh, some kind of yeah. I guess uh, I am getting truth. The Sphinx we had over here on this wall. This vertical weathering, vertical weathering that's supposed to be old at least, right? Maybe older. Um, Brian Forrester talked about it in his video. And these guys talked about it in these videos here, people you know. The true age of the Sphinx is about 12,000 years old. The Great Sphinx has this erosion controversy talking about the vertical weathering or erosion that's actually on the Sphinx itself right here. You can see that it's a one place they haven't fixed it. They fixed the paws. You can see these. this brickwork is definitely not the same stone. You can see it in the rear. And also, we know that the head's been changed, right? We think that it previously could have been um, perhaps a lion's head or Anubis's head. There's a dude standing in the new head. These things, these little key things were like 
possible construction blocks. Uh, there was supposedly, I heard one guy claim that they fit together. Um, I'm not going to bank anything on that until I see it. Where, oh, where is my next slide? This was the Atlantis discussion, and I didn't really like this article talking about the six theories of why Atlantis disappeared. And there was an interesting map that I just pulled up. Um, I'll get that on later. We'll do another video. These are old slides. I'm not going to talk about them. And then we're past all that. Into Oh, here's an interesting one. Dudes, is that Obama on Mars? Obama's head on Mars. Looks like a sculpture of a dude's head on Mars. There's another one I didn't get on here, some type of an alien piece of metal or something on Mars. And the big question about that is, first of all, where is this? Okay, yeah, the face on Mars, um, that's also possibly a megalithic structure. We have to really do more research and get over there and take a look. That's it. Please subscribe to my channel, 20 Years in Taiwan, YouTube. Go to this. You're going to find this channel on YouTube soon. I'm going to check and see if this worked. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.